Anyway, uh, bonsoir. Um, so uh, I had a shorter journey here. I came by train this morning. Um, so I'm Zunia. I'm from CERN, as um, Lorenza um, introduced me. So um, I came nicely alongside the lake this morning. So um, if you haven't visited us, um, I highly um, or very much invite you to come uh, and see us um, and uh, the LHC, which I um, show here, um, which is <coughs> underneath um, Geneva and the um, fr um, French um, countryside next to us. So um, we produce a lot of data. <laughs> um, and um, I'm in charge um, of you know, coordinating um, the um, data publishing processes, um, reproducible research activities, um, open science activities. So um, that's also why um, I already said uh, this morning a different talk that um, we do provide services that are closed access and some that are open access. <coughs> so um, meaning that um, we have large collaborative um, experiments, as you might know, CMS and Alice, um, Atlas, LHCB, for example, that um, require very strict access regimes. But um, I personally think, and um, I'm trying to work with the researchers on that, that this does not contradict um, reproducible research, um, preserving your research, and uh, providing access for future generations, PhD students to come. Because um, as, as it is here the case at APFL, we also have a huge turnover of PhD students. So it's even more important uh, for us and for you <laughs> to make sure that materials are really handed over um, within the collaboration. And if the work is not done and not ready to be shared publicly, it will happen in a closed environment. Um, it doesn't matter if we talk about open science or um, reproduci reproducible research. I personally think there's a solution for everyone. Um, and as you will see in my um, 20 slides, um, I will rush through them. I'm a fairly pragmatic person, so I think um, there is a solution for most people. If there is none, um, it's needed to explore a little further, but there's always a way. <laughs> so um, I'm, we're not alone in the world at CERN, obviously, so um, you know very well that there's so many different data sources. I um, put this here because I worked um, for a research organization which did polar research before. I'm a geoscientist by training. Um, so um, there's a lot of unique data out there, if it comes from the LHC or from the Ar Arctic, it all matters. The same is true for um, old historic documents, like this one for example, where um, I have some friends and co um, who do uh, research on such documents, it's also research data. This is nicely being taken care of, of course, by institutions um, which consider heritage um, their thing, <laughs> so the British Library in this case. Um, why do we care about it? I don't have to say it again. It uh, seems to be a topic. I've, I came this morning here uh, and every, for every PhD student and every group I've talked to over the day. Um, we have been asked um, to provide <laughs> our data, um, preserve it, share it um, if possible. Um, so there is a lot of pressure. I can say for us at CERN, it's sometimes even more complicated because uh, we get funding from so many different resources. Um, you know, in every research group there is, um, I mean, 10, 20 different uh, countries present, so we have to comply with everything. Um, it doesn't make life <laughs> easier. Um, so um, on top of this, um, there's the other side, and these are the publishers. So um, I, I'm preparing an article uh, for Nature right now, for example. So um, I have to provide the data, I have to make it accessible, um, and ideally even reproducible. What all this means, terms, I mean, it's still very flexible to, um, you know, and we can interpret it in the way we want, um, because the definitions are not entirely clear. Uh, but I think that's an opportunity because we can still shape the picture. So um, at least um, for that's how we take it. So um, in terms of, um, you know, developing our own services um, and solutions. Um, Anyway, I said um, I'm a pragmatic person, so I'm fairly focused on solutions and you know, showing some pathways on how you can share your data. Um, coming from CERN, I know of course uh, that <laughs> um, if you share your data, you often have to share software too, um, because if, you, if we only share data, no one would be able to use it because it's um, massive and um, you don't have the scripts to understand it, et cetera, et cetera. So we do both. Um, so if I use the word data, I personally usually mean also software as an equivalent. Um, I do think um, publishing data, unless of course it's sensitive data, you know, you're not ready to share it and all these uh, reasons, it's fairly easy. So data publishing 101, 
starts with finding a trusted repository. You go to uh, re3data.org, comes uh, um, in a second, uh, find one, get an, um, submit your data, get an ID for your data set, a DOI, digital object identifier, for example. Assign um, basic metadata. And I mean, I personally think, you know, this can also grow with um, the versions you submit. You know, start simple and enhance it step by step. If you start earlier in the research process, even with your project idea, idea um, you know, it, it's easier and uh, you don't have to do all the, um, all the stuff um, you know, in a rush when you submit your nature article. Licensing, important. Um, we had a big discussion um, about this um, already this morning in this Open Science Summer School that's happening here. Um, we at CERN really favor um, very liberal licensing. We use Creative Commons public domain dedication. You waive all rights when you um, put your data out in the open. So um, that sounds very hard, but this is really to enable um, machine processing and um, more liberal use, um, and we're really trying not to be restrictive there. We ask for a citation. Um, make sure your repository that you use is indexed. Zenodo, you might have heard about, we offer that as a service, um, is for example Google indexed. And then, of course, cite your data. Cite the DUI, and I'm coming to that in a second. So finding your repository, re3data.org, nice place um, to look, you know, if you work in physics, you, look, um, you know, there are quite a hundreds of options, some more suitable than others. If you don't know um, which one to, to um, choose, ask um, if you have librarians, for example, they are ready to help um, with your choice. Um, one favorite um, example of mine is um, Pangea, which um, does lots of data curation, help, helps you with quality assurance. It's more for the, for the earth and environmental sciences. Um, a very established one, um, you probably are aware of, is GeneBank, um, also very interoperable around the world, um, synchronized which um, is an important aspect, I personally think, um, to give data visibility. Because um, if you go through the effort of sharing your data, um, you also want to make sure it's being found. Because if no one sees it, I mean, what's the point, uh, I think. Um, of course, you can also go the other way around. If no one should see it, <laughs> can I <laughs> put it somewhere else? But uh, I don't want to get started with that. And then, of course, Zenodo. So, um, I've had the impression that Zenodo is um, quite well known here already, which um, is a nice uh, surprise <laughs> for us, of course. So it's uh, free of charge um, and um, connects to your ORCID and uh, GitHub account if you have one. Um, and um, GitHub um, is a collaborative platform that um, this is one of our projects here for reproducible research. Uh, we use a lot. Um, it's, of course, um, a commercial um, product. Um, one should not forget about that, and it's really more collaborative. It, but it enables you to share, um, you know, work, or to work on projects online in a collaborative manner fairly easily. And then, if you are ready to preserve um, an interim product, a final product, you can, for example, push this very easily just by clicking a button to Zenodo, um, and it's preserved. And the link, then, you can cite in your paper or send to um, Swiss National Science Foundation. Um, so um, these are solutions that are um, developing, and there's a similar one for Open Science Framework, which is um, NSF funded um, originally, and tons of other funds have emerged for this project or platform as well, so it's fairly well backed up. Very collaborative platform, project management um, style. Um, more than data, manage, I, data management, I would say. So, um, you know, um, also for co-editing of articles and these kind of things. And they also have a connection to um, the Harvard Dataverse, which is also a repository system um, serving a wide range of disciplines. Um, so you can work here collaboratively over the course of your project from the start to the end and push whatever you want to preserve throughout the project lifetime. Um, to the archive that sits in Harvard and is also considered a trusted repository. I have a few minutes left. Five minutes. Very good. Um, so um, I've been rushing through um, some slides here. Um, the, um, for me, it's really important to underline that data publishing is easy. So in the sense of, you know, okay, it might, be, it might take you a few minutes to understand wh which is your favorite repository. Um, you might have other materials that you need to link, etc. 
but um, it's important that um, your data can be discovered, can be found, and it's important that it gets attributed to you. So um, that, you know, obviously you want to get credit for your work, so um, that's what this is about. There are studies, um, this one and um, a few others also in astrophysics, about that data sharing is associated with a higher um, citation rate. Um, which is nice, <laughs> but um, you need to be able to count um, these citations, um, which is of course something about you know, getting the impact, et cetera, but it's also about um, creating context. So um, this is an example um, that my PhD student found actually. Um, so in this very recent um, article shared on archive, um, physics archive, um, the uh, there is um, this, um, citation, you know, that the data set is made available, the data is cited and referenced. Now, now look at this, in particular this one. Um, you know, that's, um, that's not data citation and it's in particular not, um, you know, creating context. Um, if someone reads that article and is like, oh, you know, I want to have a look at the data, this, is, this doesn't work. <laughs> so um, what you do is, actually, this looks a little bit more complicated than it is, it's so simple. You do exactly the same um, that you do for the normal referencing and citation. You just, um, you have the DOI for your data set that you get from Zenodo, for example. And, um, you know, you put in your reference list, depending on the style you have, of course, APA or whatsoever, you know, author, year, title, repository <laughs> name, Zenodo version, um, and um, the DOI or handle or whatsoever it is, but preferably DOI. So um, you do that. And um, we do this here, for example, this is um, from CERN Open Data, comes with a citation recommendation, the data set. You do that, and the person looking at the article can directly go to the data set. Ideally, you might have ha uh, linked or um, even from the data set to GitHub or um, whatever, wherever you store your code, and then um, also to the article. So, um, you, I mean, it's very, not very difficult to do, but I mean, it's a very easy step towards reproducible research. You know, you don't make it executable or whatsoever. But um, people have um, means to see, okay, this is the connection, this is the context. Um, so um, about um, sharing code or cit citing code, GitHub has the Zenodo, uh, Zenodo has the GitHub integration, or also the other way around. Um, so uh, you can connect um, your GitHub repository and get the DUI batch, which you then can um, put to your um, Zeno um, GitHub, God, it's getting late to your GitHub <laughs> account uh, repository. So um, making it count is um, then um, the real question. Um, there's one service that we use, um, we actually have a project with them, several projects with them, um, a lot. Um, so this is ORCID, um, so Open Researcher and Contributor ID. Who has an ORCID here? Um, I have one too. <laughs> um, so um, this is, I usually use uh, my PhD student uh, who is um, Shouli Shen. Um, so M <coughs> X Shen as a, an example. So um, she gets confused with a million other um, Chinese uh, PhD students who have the same name or <laughs> initials. So um, she gets, she uses this number um, to sign her papers. I do that too. So um, she gets, um, all the papers attributed um, to her profile. So this is one of the core advocates in high physics for open science. So Carl uses this as a CV tool, um, you know, education, employment, and then he has 900 publications underneath. In, the, in this list of works, he also has code and data. So he has connected um, his ORCID to the Zenodo account and GitHub account, um, sorry, Zenodo account, and um, so all this um, shows there. Um, I really like it because um, the Higgs boson discovery papers are alongside the, um, the data sets that he shared um, for that discovery. So this is really about, um, you know, another entry point for your data to be visible um, and it can be counted. So there are funders like Wellcome Trust that um, demand, um, I think they demand, um, the ORCID um, for reporting for a project. So you don't have to go through, you know, this endless list of publications that you hopefully um, wrote during the last years or during the project lifetime. You give your ORCID and automatically gets pushed um, to the funder's database. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of work um, about that, um, on that. So that's why we have also several projects um, about ORCID integration because it's really about integrating that better in, into repository systems and uh, publisher systems, so for example, 
when you submit to Nature that, um, you know, that automatically works, works with your um, ORCID account. So um, Kyle is um, obviously relatively eager to promote his profile too, so he knows how to use him, by the way. Um, so he um, uses um, tools like Impact Story as well, where um, you can easily um, use your ORCID to um, promote um, the works you have done. So they do some ranking um, <coughs> of your publications and outputs, uh, <coughs> use alternative metrics, um, also you know, tweets, um, blog mentions, um, and you can Mendeley mentions, uh, things like that, to give an alternative view on your impact, so not only the impact factor, but um, yeah, aggregating different sources. So this is, as um, you can see here, also based on um, the ORCID profile of, of his. So what I wanted to say was um, data publishing um, is easy. Um, I mean, obviously I'm exaggerating a little bit. It needs a little bit of thought. But um, once you're, um, you know, have taken first steps, I think it's absolutely doable. In particular, if you have, um, you know, people around like the FFL librarians who are really ready to help um, and give some feedback if the repository you've chosen is, you know, the right one, or maybe you should, you know, there's a better one around. Um, so because sometimes I also help myself feel it's a bit difficult to see, you know, if this this is, you know, a long-lived thing or you know it's just a website that will be gone tomorrow. I personally think it's absolutely deserved um, to get credit for data, software, et cetera, and contributions. There are more and more um, software uh, computer scientists around, also in my team, whose core job it is um, to, you know, to develop innovative software concepts, so they really should get credit for their job too. Um, so um, hence, I, um, I showed you, you know, the ORCID, um, example, GitHub integration with Zenodo and these kind of solutions. There are many more around, or some more around, and I do believe there are many more to come. Um, and this also depends on the you know, demand and preferences from the community. So that's why I say there's still a lot of, you know, things one can do and, and depends also you know, on the interests of you and wishes, etc. So I do think, um, well, that's why I think um, it's really important to explore options. And if there is no tool around that fits you, um, yeah, well, I think one needs to uh, discuss, uh, you know, is there money available, is there no money available? It's of, of course the big question, um, also for us, I have to say. We are, um, we are going through quite some budget cuts. So anyway, um, from budget cuts um, to Lorenz. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having me, and uh, please let me know if there's anything we can do for you. <laughs> Is there any question? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a fairly technical question about DOIs and software versions mm -hmm. that are necessary to actually use scripts that you provide in order to reanalyze the data maybe 10, 15 years later. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how the DOIs of scripts, software versions, and data set versions are connected. Uh, DOIs can be versioned as well, so you can simply connect um, one DOI or a version DOI to a versioned uh, code. Okay, and where are they available? I mean, uh, okay, uh, because well, when you cite a data set, mm -hmm. you only cite the, the DOI that goes with the uh -huh. data set and not necessarily with the scripts or with the software ah, versions that ah, are attached okay. to it in order to be able to make use of the data that you're citing. Yes, so um, when you um, for example, taking the Zenodo example, you cite uh, the Zenodo DOI, a version no, 1, 1.2 1. or whatsoever, um, then it goes directly to the um, 1.2 version um, homepage of that code on Zenodo. So it's a kind of a redirecting service. So the code is stored on Zenodo and has a website, splash page, however you want to call it, on Zenodo. Okay, and uh, a second question is about how are you going about maintaining software in order to be able that in 10 years in a different uh, uh, environment like Windows 12 or 13 that you can actually reuse the, the, the software that uh, has been created for it. Yeah, and so if, if you uh, attribute the DOIs to that software, 
somehow the version that uh, was used at the time when you got the DOI for your software would have to be available somewhere okay, yeah, and yeah. a system available to reproduce it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that I cannot give you a super constructive answer on that, but I mean, this is obviously a huge challenge, I mean, also for us. I mean, um, the DUI part, I mean, um, is really only to locate the place um, and to the archive. So um, what happens then behind the scenes, you know, I mean, Zenodo also doesn't do obviously active curation on the code that's being given. So, you know, it's a, it's a place and that, that keeps it the way it is. So um, if you as an experiment, collaboration, et cetera, need to make sure that um, you know, the software you are using is um, continuously, you know, is ready to, to run an, an analysis in 10 years from now, I mean, that uh, of course, you know, you need to investigate into virtual machines. So we have, for example, CERN VM, um, as a system set up, um, the specific file system to keep such things alive, so which is also preserved and um, with snapshots. So there are solutions, but this is a little, this is, um, I mean, uh, d disconnected from the DUI part um, in, in terms of that's a su separate super big topic. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm not saying it's not relevant at all, it's super relevant, but uh, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, we have some workshops on that, uh, several day workshops <laughs> on software preservation, so I'm happy to talk about it, but yeah, it's complex. Um, more questions? Thank you very much.